Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hello to everyone. I'm Louisa Kasdan, your host for Let's Talk About Food, a podcast devoted to first-person storytelling where food plays a pivotal, if not a starring role. Everyone has a food story. Food is at the heart of human connection, at the center of love, of ritual, of need and want, and most of all, food creates community. And community is what we crave. Our guest today is Frank Lowenstein. Frank serves as Senior Director of Climate Culture Boston at RARE, a global nonprofit where he focuses on driving forward programs promoting climate positive behaviors. Frank's a lifelong environmentalist, serving as COO of the New England Forestry Foundation. His task now is to use behavior change models to tip the needle on climate change and sustainability. In anticipation of Earth Day, we spoke about what each of us can do in our own homes, plus what I should do about my beloved eight burner gas stove. RARE is an environmental change organization that's been around for 50 years that I've never heard of. So tell me, RARE, it's a wonderful name. It has nothing to do with rare gems or rare meat or rare anything else other than rare good stuff. So tell me a little bit about RARE, Frank, and your role in it. Sure. So RARE has been around, as you said, for about 50 years, and our work has focused on some of the poorest people in the richest places on the planet. We've done a ton of work in the Philippines. Break that down for me. (laughs) Poorest (laughs) people in the richest places. Explain that to me a little. Well, we do a lot of work in the tropics with small artisanal fishing villages, with small scale farmers in the highlands of the Andes, helping communities to shift behavior in ways that are going to help them, the people, and nature around them thrive. So we're really different than a lot of environmental organizations. We're not about like drawing a line on a map and saying, this is the reserve, everybody stay out of it. We're about how do people and nature thrive together. Um, So we've done, for example, uh, a lot of our work in the Philippines. We started working with one small village of artisanal fishers, and they knew that the dynamite fishing and the electrofishing that they were doing were actually destroying the reef, destroying the resource that they were dependent on. But they were in this competitive situation where they all felt like they had to do this because everybody else was doing it. And so if they didn't do it, they were going to lose out. The next door neighbor was going to get all the fish. So we helped the community to come together to make clear the belief that was already there They shouldn't be doing this, even though they were, and then help them coordinate the shift so they all shifted at the same time, and then tracked the fisheries and showed them how when they stopped doing this, both the number of fish in the sea, but also their catch, both went up at the same time. 
And so that was a real success. Of course, they started talking to their friends, neighbors, relatives. And in just a relatively small number of years, we've gone from working in one fishing village in the Philippines to working with 600 of the 800 artisanal fishing villages that are recognized. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I read on your website something I didn't exactly understand, which is that your basic operation is to induce behavioral change. What do you mean by behavioral change? Yeah. So our behaviors are shaped by all kinds of things, right? Our beliefs, our morals, our finances, our upbringing. But it turns out that one of the very most powerful determinants of behavior is social norms. What the people who you think of as your people, your neighbors, your family, your church or synagogue or mosque, what you think your social group expects of you, you are inclined to do. That opens up a lot of opportunities for helping people to make shifts in behavior that they want to make. You can both sometimes reveal that the expectations are different than people think they are. And that's certainly true in the climate space where I work. But you can also help elevate and make salient the examples of behaviors that you think are desirable, that the community is trying to move towards. You can make those more prominent and that can help to shift behavior more quickly. So for example, if my neighbors are avid composters, and I am not, I'm going to feel more inclined to compost? Yeah. And particularly if you feel not just that your neighbors compost, but you care about your neighbors, they're part of your social network, and you feel like they expect that you would compost, that composting is a good thing for the planet or for the community. And their expectation is that you're not just going to throw away your food, your waste food. So it's that social expectation piece that's the key. Hmm. Interesting. I can see that that's how we change behaviors based upon what our community norms are. That makes sense. And I can see that if we're trying to understand something, which is very hard for me at an individual level, that my small acts, if I start to compost or if I stop using plastic bags or if I... Mm -hmm do all sorts of things, how we magnify that. So it doesn't just feel like one stupid little thing that I'm doing all by myself in the confines of the four walls of my house. Isn't that so liberating? Really, the message here is each of us has a superpower. And that superpower is the influence that we have on our friends and neighbors and relatives and community group members. Each of us, you, Louisa, and everyone who's listening, is a powerful actor of change that can influence everybody who cares about you. Hmm. So Frank, how did you come to this? How did you come to Rare? Can you take us back a little bit to the beginning? You, at one point when we were talking, you referenced yourself as like president of the ecology club or environmental club when you were in high school. Tell me a little bit about how you grew up and how that relates to food and gardening and environment. Yeah, I had a pretty typical upbringing, sort of a middle-class guy. I grew up mostly in the suburbs of Maryland with a few years down in New Orleans when my dad took a job down there for a few years. There was this very powerful moment when I was about six and my dad and I were driving on this road called Bells Mill Road in suburban Maryland and we saw a fox. And I, as a six-year-old, I was so excited. And the fox, it didn't just like cross the road. It hung out in the road. It was playing around with something. We got a good long look at this fox and it was thrilling to me. And so then we moved to New Orleans. We moved back a few years later and Bell's Mill Road was gone. And Democracy Boulevard, which is a six-lane highway, and the Montgomery Mall were directly on top of where the fox had been. And I was devastated. It's interesting. A lot of people that I know who are doing environmental work have a similar story, a story of loss. And so that really inspired me. And I started to spend more and more time in nature. 
Uh, my good friends, uh, the Sunderlands, took me out hiking and got me into rock climbing. Then in, in high school, I joined the ecology club. And then when I went off to college, I joined the outing club and the whitewater club and um, served in leadership roles in all those various groups and just kept getting more and more involved with and in love with the beauty of nature. And I've been here in New England since I came to Cambridge for college and have been just in love with the New England landscape ever since. It is okay to say that you went to Harvard when you would say you were in Cambridge. You it's know, okay. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be super, super embarrassed about the fact that I went to Harvard. It's like just such a white privilege kind of thing to say. And so I don't know. My world is an MIT world and they're never oh, nice. embarrassed. No MIT person is ever shy about telling you they went to MIT. <laughs> just, That's probably just healthier. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so you here you were this young environmentalist. Were you into food at all? Oh, I've always been into food. And I've since I was very, very young, I have been an avid gardener. My dad did that and he taught it to me. And there are some wonderful family stories about our garden, like when we moved to New Orleans and my dad planted broccoli in the front beds while he waited for the landscaping to come. And when the landscaping finally came, my mom wouldn't let him remove the broccoli bushes that were like taller than me uh, that had survived the winter just fine. It was like broccoli is a perennial in New Orleans. Okay. So anyway, I grew up gardening avidly. I still grow most of my vegetables about six months of the year. So Even in Massachusetts? Huh. Oh, yeah. Wow. I have terrifyingly, I have kale, spinach, and miner's lettuce, and lettuce, and cilantro that all survived the winter. I have never before had quite so many things make it through the winter. So I guess that says there are a few good things about climate change, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so when I went to college, I knew a lot about vegetables, and I knew a lot about growing food, but I didn't know anything about making food. And in college, that shifted for me a little bit. Well, I ended up living in a co-op house at Harvard of 34 people who made all decisions by full consensus. Our house <laughs> meetings took hours and also shared food. We bought food collectively and we took turns cooking dinner. So I had to learn to make things that people wanted to eat and specifically that 34 other people with diverse taste in food would want to eat. <laughs> that whole social norms thing comes right into play, right? I had to quickly accommodate my um, cooking to things that people were going to consume. Like the time that I made miso cayenne tea, I had a whole lot of leftover miso cayenne tea for myself. <laughs> Nobody else wanted it. <laughs> I can just imagine that you could write a cookbook based upon all the things which actually passed muster. Did they like lasagna? I mean, what did they all eat? <laughs> oh, it was highly varied. And of course, we had some vegetarians and some non-vegetarians. So there was always the debate, is it okay to have two different entrees or do you need to always cook? just a vegetarian entree. And this is why house meetings took hours. But it was one of the most important parts of my educational experience at Harvard was both learning those tools of how do you manage coming to consensus and also learning to really cook. And so then after all of this, you, uh, you entered the great world of environmental activism. Tell us what you did next. Oh, well, actually, I didn't do environmental activism. My senior year, I fell in love with writing, and I worked for a series of newspapers and magazines. I worked for Technology Review at MIT. I worked for the Cambridge Express. I was the last editor of the Cambridge Express before the publisher ran off to Florida with the entire bank account and the very attractive advertising manager. Uh, <laughs> that was quite the interesting story. And, and I also worked for several years for Oceanus magazine out of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and did, then ended up doing freelance writing. And it was while I was doing the freelance writing that I got attracted back to my environmental interests and decided that I needed to go to grad school to really understand the environment better. And so I went to the University of Vermont to the Field Naturalist Program 
which is a fascinating, integrative, really hmm. in-depth look at environmental problem solving. And I came out of that understanding what a mess we were in and that we had let ourselves into and how much worse it was likely to get unless we made some changes. And so since then, I've been devoting myself to helping make some of those changes real in the world. And hmm. have worked for the Nature Conservancy for over 20 years, worked for New England Forestry Foundation for eight years, and now the last couple of years have come to rare and just really am finding the power of these approaches to human behavior. Do you think people fully understand how committed people are to climate change? No, I'm. we actually have data that says that people vastly underestimate how much their social circle does support climate action. We did what we call an index study to look at these behavioral cues and to not only see what do the people who are responding to the study think themselves, but what do they estimate that others in their social circle think about these different behaviors around food, energy, transportation, and support of nature. And fascinatingly, people by substantial majorities are supportive of these climate actions. But the, when you ask them what do they think their social circle thinks, the percentages that are inaccurate, people don't realize that the support is as high as it is. So there's this bubble there, this social norm bubble, where people are thinking that their social circle doesn't necessarily support these actions when in fact it does. And so that, that's great news for behavioral approaches like RARES, because it means that all we have to do is make these behaviors a little more salient, a little more obvious, a little more, oh, he did that or she did that. I can do that too. We should see a very rapid shift in behavior. That's what the science, the behavior science tells us. Hmm. Make it easy to adopt. And then everybody sees that it. this is what we do. Yeah, make it salient that mm -hmm. people actually mm -hmm. do support these behaviors. That's Amazing. why some solar panels, for example, are such a good thing because they are, in fact, so salient. They're, they're obvious. You walk around the neighborhood, you see them. And we'll be back with Frank Lowenstein in just a moment. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. And we are back with Frank Lowenstein of Rare. One of the reasons that we wanted to talk to you about Rare and about you in particular was that we're staring down the calendar to Earth Day, which mm -hmm. always makes us think, what can we do? What is your role at Rare? And how does that relate to, to Earth Day and other things that we're thinking about? Yeah. So I'm the, officially the senior director of a program called Climate Culture Boston, a portion of RARE's new climate initiative, Climate Culture, which is focused on how do we bring this approach about human behavior and helping communities make shifts that they need to make to the climate issue. And I'm sure you know that just within the last couple of weeks, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, 
released its sixth assessment report that basically says we have to make dramatic changes if we are going to avoid um, real disaster, both societally and economically, and in many cases, personally. Climate culture is focused on what role can individual behavior change make? How much of a difference can individual behavior change make? And it turns out when you look at the science of it, it's quite dramatic. There are a number of things that each of us can do uh, starting tomorrow that collectively make a huge impact on the climate problem, a huge beneficial impact on the climate problem. So back to your, does it matter if I use a plastic bag in the kitchen? No, it doesn't matter if you use a plastic bag in the kitchen and throw it away. But if 5 million Bostonians each stop using plastic bags and throwing them away, then that makes a much bigger difference. So the behavior approach is about this social approach to behavior. It's about how do you get to collective action through individual decisions and how do you help people with those decisions. So Climate Culture Boston is one of four approaches that RARE is using to forward these behavioral norms. And we're focused on four areas of behavior. What do we eat? How do we get around? How do we get our energy? And what can we do to support nature in our communities? Because nature is a very powerful force of climate healing. Trees and coral reefs and marshes all sequester carbon, removing it from the atmosphere and helping us solve the problem. And so break that down for me a little bit. What are some of the behavioral changes specifically that you're trying to promulgate in Boston? Sure. Well, let's let's talk about food first. Okay. I love the title of your podcast. It's awesome. <laughs> so in the food space, there are really two behaviors that we're focused on. One is probably the most important is eating less beef. It turns out that ruminant animals like cows also including sheep and goats, but we eat far fewer of them than we do of cows, they release methane from their four stomachs as they are digesting grass. Grass is hard to digest. I certainly wouldn't want to eat it. And so they have these four stomachs, and as they digest the grass, they release methane. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, 20 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. So if you can shift from eating ruminants, like not eat beef, instead eat pork, instead eat chicken, instead eat fish or turkey. There are many options. Guinea pigs. If you can shift your behavior. No. Not, not doing like the guinea pigs. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I spent about four months living in Ecuador and um, guinea pig is a common part of the diet there and I could not bring myself to try it. I am <laughs> embarrassed to say. But... Yeah. Anyway, if we can eat less beef, that's probably among the most important things that we can do to reduce our climate impact. About two thirds of the impact that of the emissions associated with production of meat comes from the production of beef specifically. So it's a a, a powerful strategy. And Meat consumption, meat production is a majority of the emissions associated with agriculture when you actually include, okay, we're going to grow corn to feed to the beef to get it to our table. So that doesn't mean you don't ever get to eat a hamburger or a steak or whatever other form of beef you like. It means thinking about it as a treat. And, you know, I'm going to save that up until I'm really ready for it. And Meanwhile, I'm going to have other sources of protein during the week. There are plenty of vegetarian sources of protein that are just wonderful and that have even much lower carbon impact than chicken or pork. But the eating less beef is the first behavior. The second one is wasting less food. On a global basis, something close to 30% of the food that we produce doesn't actually make it into a human mouth. And some of it is... Uh, lost in storage or shipment. Some of it is never sells in the store. A fair amount of it is just wasted in our refrigerators. That avocado that that got ripe on the counter and you said, oh, I better put it in the fridge so it doesn't get too ripe. And then you forget it for a week. That's just a loss to the whole climate system. 
So there's on the food waste front, there's all kinds of strategies to reduce how much food you're wasting in terms of menu planning and thinking about some meals that can be stone soup style things. What can you do with a refrigerator potluck pizza? But there's also strategies around going back to what you raised earlier. Gee, is there a way you can compost your waste instead of throwing it away? Because when you throw it away, it often ends up in a landfill where it decomposes without access to oxygen and again releases methane, that very powerful greenhouse gas that we want to Hmm. avoid at all costs. Hmm. I hadn't really thought about that part of it, that the cycle goes on. That's interesting. So eating less beef specifically, secondarily the other ruminants, I get that, wasting less food, which people can do. Um, Not everybody has good strategies for that, but I'm sure that you have a way to help them. What else can we do? Yeah. So just I'll just mention we do on rare.org slash Boston, we do have an action hub that has resources to help people. If you want strategies and tools for how you can waste less food, that's a good place to start. There are many other places to go to on the web. It's There's a lot of, of attention to that. Other things we can do in terms of, of energy, the, it, there are... Renewable energy is progressively becoming cheaper. It's now cheaper to produce an energy via solar than it is via coal, for example. And so there are things you can do to be part of that energy revolution and to save money at the same time. A lot of people who can put solar on their houses have already done so. Some people can't do it because you live in the shadow of a skyscraper or you have a big tree next to your house or your roof is old and you know you're going to replace it in three or four years and you really don't want to put solar panels on there and then have to take them off to put the new roof on. Or this, your building's kind of frail and you don't it can't hold them up. Or you don't own the roof. You're a renter or it's a condo association. You don't have control over the roof. Mm-hmm. For those people, there are many states that allow access to what's called community solar, where you essentially can rent part of a solar panel that is located somewhere else. Often you see these big fields of solar like in along interchanges along highways. Sometimes you see them in the edges of agricultural fields. Those are often, not always, but those are often community solar developments that you can effectively rent your solar panel and not have to have it on your house. And the way the solar companies structure this, you can start saving money by doing that tomorrow without having to put out a lot of money up front, without a long-term commitment, without a penalty for withdrawing earlier. It's really something that people, everyone could do, and everyone probably should do, both to help the climate and to save money. I have to ask you, because every time I turn on the TV, my beautiful eight-burner gas stove is under assault. Um, Where are you and Rare on all of this? And should I feel guilty about using my stove? That's what I want to know. (laughs) It certainly is better to shift from a gas stove to an electric induction stove. And you can still get the sort of instant reduction from hot to simmer that you get. That's such a wonderful thing about gas stoves. So in the long run, the solution to the climate crisis is we need to stop using fossil fuels. And that means we need to stop making appliances that use fossil fuels. It means we need to stop putting in new pipelines. It means we need to stop leasing new oil fields and gas fields to companies that are going to produce more of those substances and want to sell them to us. So long run, yes, you should think about getting yourself excited about your new eight burner electric induction (laughs) stove that's coming. But that's the long run. And the short run and the individual, there's a lot of variations in the decision. Like there was a lot of energy used to produce your eight burner stove. It's probably quite a nice heavy one with big steel grates, I'm imagining. And a lot it's of pretty fancy. <laughs> I'm not surprised. So a lot of carbon dioxide was emitted to produce that item. You don't want to just throw that away because that's just throwing away that carbon dioxide. So you want to get use out of it. So what can you do? One thing you can do, you could buy yourself an electric induction cooktop, just a single burner or a double burner one that sits on your counter. 
and use that for simple things like boiling water for your French press in the morning and save your gas stove for when you really want to simmer that roux and make the make your favorite dish, whatever it might be. So that's a solution, a bridge solution to reduce the amount that you're using your gas stove. But isn't everybody could switch to all electric cooktops? And I understand that the that there's research now that says gas stoves tend to exacerbate asthma in small children. Yep. But aren't gas stoves powered by electricity? And isn't our electricity source is either gas or oil or coal-fired? Or How am I getting ahead of this? Right. If- so if you switch to an electric stove, isn't the electricity just being produced by burning fossil fuels? Right. The short answer is less and less. All the different states here in the Northeast and many states across the country are pushing what's called a renewable portfolio standard, where essentially the amount of the electric supply that has to come from renewables goes up over time. And eventually it'll that'll drive the the electric grid to be completely carbon free. Even in states that aren't super progressive on climate, like Texas, more and more of the energy is coming from renewables just because they're cheaper. They can now outcompete coal-fired power plants, often can outcompete oil-fired power plants, will soon be outcompeting gas-fired power plants. The electric grid is becoming cleaner all the time. Even before it becomes completely clean, if the emissions are concentrated, it's much easier to clean them and to think about carbon capture and removing the carbon from the from the from a single smokestack on a gas-fired power plant than it is to think about removing the carbon or the methane that's being released in your personal house. How would you do that? It would be extremely difficult and expensive. Whereas it's potentially doable and it might be a pathway to keeping fossil fuels part of the mix for a longer period of time, which some companies think is a good idea. Um, to have that carbon capture happening at power plants. So, you know, yes, not all of the electricity is produced by renewables, but a percentage of it is already, a pretty significant percentage, and it's going to drive to higher levels. You can also, in many other states, you can sign up for 100% renewable electricity if you want to. There's a zillion companies, they'll be happy to sell it to you. Here in Massachusetts, we have what's called community aggregation, where a lot of the cities and towns have contracted to buy electricity at a discount for all of the residents of the city and town. So you've got a legitimate issue with the question of where the electricity is coming from, but it's the change is happening already. And people talk a lot about reducing their carbon footprint and being able to buy, I don't exactly know the right phrase for it, but chits from the carbon bank. But how do I do that? How do I? Yeah. I mean, I I understand how airplanes, airlines do it, but how do I and my little house do that? Right. So what you're talking about is what's commonly called carbon offsets. And, um, It is a complex and controversial area. But the basic idea is you've got this beautiful gas stove that you love that I think you told me before the show is pretty new. You don't want to get rid of it. So you're going to keep using it maybe for another decade, maybe a little longer if things go well with the stove. Can you somehow offset that impact? And the answer is yes. There are things that you that can be done out there in the world that are easier and cheaper and better than getting rid of your gas stove, like hybrid buses in the city of Bogota, Colombia, where the buses are incredibly polluting diesel monstrosities, or at least they were the last time I was there. So there are people who will say, okay, we will sell carbon credits to you, Louisa, and to 10,000 people like you, and we'll use that money to buy hybrid buses in Bogota, and that will reduce carbon pollution much more than changing out your stove would. 
But that, how do I do that? Yes, that's the problem. <laughs> Until very recently, it's been almost impossible for an individual to buy carbon offsets. Now it's becoming more possible. Rare is actually has put together a, a, a program where you can buy individual offsets, either for your entire carbon footprint for a year or for some portion of it. You could give your, your boyfriend or girlfriend a carbon offset for their cup of coffee for an entire year for Valentine's Day. <laughs> There's all kinds of innovative stuff you could do with offsets. You can access it through that same rare.org slash Boston Action Hub page. If you want to offset the typical carbon footprint for the average American who takes the average number of flights, has the average number of cars per family, et cetera, it would cost about $300 to $400 per year, which... Huh is not that bad. It's it's not insignificant, but you don't have to offset your whole carbon footprint either. If what you can afford is to offset one eighth of your carbon footprint, $50 a year, that's still a big difference. And m many of the carbon offset projects and most of the ones that Rare currently has online are operating through nature and how nature, again, sequesters carbon, stores it for decades to centuries to, in some cases, millennia. So. so I calculate my carbon offset, or perhaps there's a tool that helps me do that. Yeah. And then there is some high-minded group of people somewhere who say, ooh, let's apply that to this, which is climate amelioration in some way. Yeah. All the different offset projects have to be certified and there are various certifying companies that have their protocols for doing those certifications. Rare focuses in on what we think are the best of those certification protocols, and we only offer those projects through our website. So, you know, that's the, be the, the best of the best today. You could go about it as estimating your individual carbon footprint, and there are about a zillion carbon footprint calculators out there to help you do that. But you could also just approach it differently and say, I know I have a carbon footprint and I don't, I either, I have a lot of money or I don't have a lot of money, but what I can afford towards offsetting my carbon footprint is X. And then you go buy X worth of offsets. Wow. You know, if I can assuage my guilt about my gorgeous eight burner stove by buying a carbon offset, that'll help me sleep at night. Absolutely. And for one stove, even an eight burner one, that's maybe the equivalent of two stoves, uh, it's not going to be very much to offset hmm. that. Hmm. It's fascinating to talk to you, Frank. I know you have children and stepchildren. Have you been able to create this consciousness in the rest of your family? Um, to some extent, yeah. My uh, my son just had an electric heat pump installed at his home in the Berkshires that he shares with his fiance. They went out and purchased that. So now they're not using their gas much for heating anymore at all. And then my uh, my stepson, Jaden, um, the other day saw me throw out a plastic bag and he was like, you're a terrible environmentalist. So <laughs> I think I've succeeded. <laughs> That is great. Well, it's so fun to talk to you. And I'll be looking for Earth Day and I'll be starting to follow rare.org backslash Boston to see all the things that you're proposing and see how I can use some of those strategies to create behavioral change in my neighborhood as well. And keep in mind, you have a superpower. What is my your, superpower? <laughs> your superpower is your influence on your neighbors, your social circle, your friends. People underestimate how much influence they have. That's great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. This was a pleasure. This was a pleasure. And just again, we'd love you to check out what we're up to. And our website is, one more time, rare.org backslash Boston. Thank you, Frank, and happy Earth Day. Let's all do our part. Thanks for listening. Let's Talk About Food is produced by The Food Voice. I'm producing, along with audio director and composer Mike Moss of Soundscape Boston. You can find more of our stories at our website, letstalkaboutfood.com, and on Heritage Radio or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Let's Talk About Food is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.